Thank you, Terry. So welcome, and I'm happy to be here this morning. Uh, Senator Larry Lewick, I farm, for those of you that I'm over in the southeast corner of the county, of course. Um, I have uh, been working on a lot of <clears throat> ag things and veteran affair issues. Uh, that is my, my task this session with uh, the Ag Committee. It's Ag and Veterans Affairs, so anything dealing with veterans I handle in my committee. I'm also on the judiciary. Uh, I'm a most senior member of the Judiciary Committee as well. In the Ag Committee, we've been working on the, you probably have uh, heard and seen a little bit about the corporate farming bill, which is uh, it's a spin-off of what the old uh, constitutional uh, measure was on the ballot. We changed that up, working with Farmers Union and all of the Ag groups to get this to the point where it's acceptable. The reason that this is coming about is uh, animal agriculture in the state of North Dakota is almost, it's, it's defunct almost. And uh, we need to uh, beef that back up a little bit because uh, there are so many benefits to having an animal agriculture alongside of the grain farming that we're doing. We are shipping out uh, a tremendous amount of uh, food stock for animals out of this state that we should be utilizing here within the state. Um, the um, raw milk bill, that's uh, a done deal, I believe. We just had a conference committee on that. So now if you are wishing to uh, uh, drink raw milk, I think this next year you'll be able to buy that and uh, do that without having to own cow shares. Um, let's see. In Judiciary uh, 2281, which is a gambling bill, we put $400,000 into a gambling task force to help regulate and moderate and, and to uh, oversee the gaming industry in the state of North Dakota, which is getting to be an absolute nightmare. Um, I think, I don't know if you've seen that article that was in the Bismarck Tribune yesterday, but um, there was an article in there stating that there was some investigation going on with the, with the Wall of Honor, and uh, there it, it's going to go a whole lot deeper than that. There's a lot of corrupt uh, companies in the state of North Dakota, and uh, be wary about some of the things if you are involved with ga uh, uh, charitable gaming because it's getting serious. It's getting ugly. It's getting uh, very uh, crooked. Um, there was a misquote in there, though, that said that the legislature approved the ETAB machines in North Dakota. We did not. The uh, Attorney General's office was all behind that, not the legislature. We approved a little slide along, a uh, little notebook size deal with two games on it. And uh, the Attorney General's office is the one that approved those machines. So that, that we didn't do that. Um, 2036, which is the water bill that uh, we've been working on over the interim. Uh, as you may know, I was the chairman of the Water Drainage Committee this last interim, and uh, we have uh, taken some sections of code, lumped them together to make uh, a better water management program out of uh, what's happening in the state. Um, 2372 is a water, another water bill that is um, requiring counties that haven't formed a joint water board with an adjoining county that has a uh, water project or a water structure that goes between the jurisdictions of one county to, an, to the next, they are required to form a joint water board now because the ones, the counties that are having problems with this are the county boards that don't get along with adjoining county boards, so they're not going to, it's, it's been voluntary all along, but they will not form these boards, so this requires them to do so. Um, 1423 is a bill that um, what it does is it it sets up counties for these animal feedlots. So it gives them the opportunity to actually uh, put documentation together and uh, finding out what counties can or do want to have the animal feedlots versus the ones that don't. It uh, gives us a, a, a better idea of 
where these uh, animal feedlots could be located and where they shouldn't be located. Um, 2364, I was, uh, I don't know if I was a, I think of a co-sponsor on that one. That is, a, um, it's an eminent domain bill that uh, requires, uh, that I don't particularly like to see eminent domain used on any pipelines and I don't think that that's necessary. So that's one of the bills that I was on as well. I'll stop there and uh, let uh, Representative uh, Mitzkog take okay. over for a while. Well, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. I really appreciate you coming out and listening to what we've been doing. And I, um, I have the honor of serving on the Appropriations Committee. In my section, I'm in the Human Resources Division. So the second half of the session, we're consumed with um, really one bill. It's the Depart Department of Human Services. And so I spend eight, eight plus hours a day in a nice small community, community or committee room and go upstairs once a day for the, and to hear about the policy bills and vote on those bills. So I can't comment specifically on policy bills because that's not my, what my work is. But I'll tell you, the Department of Human Service budget, it, it really touches most every life in North Dakota, from seniors to early, you know, for young children. But I will tell you, um, it's the largest bill, uh, budget in North Dakota, um, part of our, our state budget. And um, it's really complex. and it, it's really kind of, it's concerning. Um, I, this is my second session on the budget committee, but um, we're seeing this this growth, and you know, really, we're we're making we're having to make some difficult decisions about really for our population. I mean, we just we have to kind of we have to constrain it a little bit, and knowing though that cuts will affect North Dakota lives. So right now we're deep into, we're gonna kick it out on Monday morning and then, then the work starts when we start um, kind of duking it out with the Senate over the, the final changes. But some of the good things that are coming out of that budget, uh, long-term care, including St. Gerard's, I think there's some real good stable funding and that was brought about by the new funding formula last session. So I think they're gonna be in good shape. Um, we're also sending 12.9 million to senior meals. So this, the building we're here, the meals that they're really um, importantly providing to North Dakota seniors, they're gonna get a little boost in, in, in funding for that. We're also investing in childcare, which I think a lot of North Dakota families are facing some really just increasing costs and difficulty finding slots for their kids. So we're investing in that and Part of our budget, as well as the, um, a standalone budget will, or a bill, will be coming out to address that. Um, I was, let's see, I just want to quickly, oh, um, behavioral health. Part of our budget will include increased funding for school behavioral health services that we so critically need for our young people, as well as um, part of our law enforcement response. So a couple of cool things that are coming out. Um, we'll be now equipping, equipping law enforcement vehicles with iPads. So if they come upon an incident where somebody's in a, uh, like a mental health crisis, they'll be able to connect with some experts that will kind of help them de-escalate the situation. Really will give our law enforcement some necessary tools to really avoid some really disastrous or you know fatal kind of types of encounters as well as you know, when they bring these individuals to jail, we're hearing from jail administrators that they don't have the help that they need to. If you lock up somebody that's in a mental health crisis, it just it makes it worse. So they'll be able to get them connected with a psychiatrist immediately through an, um, a virtual type of format. So that's really gonna be, I think, um, helpful to law enforcement and you know, keeping our communities safe and taking care of these people that are um, mentally ill. But, um, I was part of a bill that sent $20 million out for emergency township, um, city, county, um, township, and snow removal. Um, some grants there, so I think that's much needed to help with their budgets. And um, let's see what else quickly here. I could touch briefly, this is not my section, but the, the K-12 funding. Um, I know there's some challenges there with the inflators. They're not, you know, it's to keep on par with the rest of the state employees. But um, that's continuing. I think you'll see some changes, Chad, you'll see some changes coming out in, in conference committee because that's not settled yet. Um, oh, golly. I'll leave it at that. And um, 
I know I see some county commissioners in the back and I will talk on the prairie dog. Um, Mike Brandenburg told us the other day, I went up to him, I said, oh my goodness, what just happened? He goes, we got rolled. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, they did some changes with the buckets and I'm not happy and it was kind of <laughs> hidden in a bill and they, they do some sneaky stuff, but we can talk a little bit. Please ask about that. <laughs> so, Cindy. Yeah. Good morning, Cindy Shriver back. I, li I live just south of Wapton, about a mile. Um, so I, I went there to work on childcare, which uh, Elise just covered, workforce, education, economic development, whether it's rural, urban, whatever it takes to do economic development. So uh, looking at education, which I do serve on the education committee on the House side, um, we finally passed a computer science and cybersecurity bill. I'm a, I'm a pretty much a local control girl and limited government. And in this case, it was very, very important for the state to institute some requirements that our students um, do have the opportunity to have learn about cybersecurity from K-12. So it's all integrated in that regard into the curriculum that's existing and then have the opportunity to have a computer science class. We did get a lot of pushback, um, sadly, but we did get a somewhat watered down version of that bill passed. But it's extremely important if you talk to business and industry and higher education that that be done. Oh, what else? Um, right now, obviously, um, we're looking at education um, holistically from a state perspective. Our scores right now are not what they what we would like to see. Uh, reading scores about 40% work intensively on science of reading, and um, we have about 20% of our students are noted as being dyslexic. So we are working towards some screening and uh, different attitude, different things to that because that those are building blocks that we need to have in place. So on the there's putting together a task force on the funding formula, and we know that's been in being utilized since about 2013, I believe, has not been changed. And so there'll be a task force looking at that, whether or not um, there's been some ideas floating around, but that'll happen over the interim. And basically we'll have um, people coming in there are not within the state to, to look at that and help us. There's uh, been a lot of bills detrimental to public education, K-20, and that means um, our elementary up to our, our colleges. And, um, but they don't, t they don't touch our private schools, but they touch all our public schools. So it's been very, heard some very heartfelt, heartfelt testimonies from teachers and uh, parents and such. So um, it's, it's been rather difficult looking at those and, and how, how it's harming our education system. There's, um, let's see, Sen the Senator Lewitt covered a lot of the egg. I do sit on the egg committee. Um, but overall, the, the controversial bills, um, uh, I think, have set North Dakota back years on the national, international stage. So hopefully um, we can do better. Uh, but so many of those are set right now, um, whether it's um, the library issues or whatever. And uh, a lot of people against them, and somehow they seem to uh, come through this. The testimonies I, I feel are relatively ignored. So that's about it, and I'm ready for questions, please. Do we have any questions written down yet? Or I do have one here. Um, how can you say you support local control but vote against local control so often? Books in local libraries, local water policy, approving voting in Fargo, prone on legislation, local schools. <laughs> Voting against providing school lunch and then vote to give yourself an increase of meal per diem. So that's kind of a comment and a question. So, uh, and, and hopefully our questions, each one would be able to respond somehow to that. So whoever wants to start. I'll start because okay. I, I, I kind of kind of <laughs> tailed into that, didn't yeah. I? Um, I believe on all of those, I probably voted against every one of those bills. Um, Fargo issue, Fargo itself voted 63% voted to have approval voting. And there was a bill that came across, not from a Fargo resident, um, that uh, took away the ability to have ranked choice voting or approval voting. <coughs> so if you look nationally, um, probably some cities are looking at ranked choice a little bit more expensive than approval. But Fargo voted 63%. And I don't think uh, that this, the state of North Dakota should come in and say you can't do that. So. Um, 
Yeah, which other one was it? You know, I'm a. It was. Uh, it was more mainly oh, the question library, was about yeah. why why yeah, you say you support no. local control, mm -hmm. but yet bills are getting passed that yeah. take local control away. Right, and they and they are, and I agree with that totally. I think I I know I mentioned that in my opening remarks that we are t we are not leaving things to the locals, whether it be education, um, in this case, uh, how they want to vote for their city officials. They're not changing how we vote across the state. They're just doing it internally. So um, I believe in local control. Like I said, we did the cyber bill, but generally local control is the closest to where the issues are, and that's who should be make, making the decisions. Okay. Yeah, well, I echo a lot of what Cindy said, but um, I voted no on all those issues, and it's really troubling. I, I'm not sure what happens to <laughs> legislators when, they walk through the, when we walk through the doors that I think they ignore, I think, what the majority of North Dakotans want. but very troubling issues and the lack of respect for local experts and and just I, I shake my head it's embarrassing um, by the actions of the legislature and I, I believe it will set our state back and and it creates big rifts between I think the good work that local governments school dis, you know, school boards to city councils or county commissioners township officers are doing and you know for us to circumvent their their decisions and think we know more I it's disappointing, so I'll leave it at that. Well, it's quite a loaded question. Uh, each one of those has a different answer, I believe. So I'll start with <clears throat> the pronoun one. Um, I was contacted by, I would say, four teachers and two administrators from District 25 when this came out, but they were very much in support of this bill, okay? Uh, it's not my language. It comes from Catholic Conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, it comes from other state agencies that have to do with uh, working with the public and uh, wanting to have, that have problems with this particular topic of pronouns. Uh, the, the intended language in that, and I absolutely, I want you to understand this from the very beginning. Uh, I love each and every one of you and everyone else I have no prejudices of any kind, okay? Coming through judiciary though, for the years that I've been there, we have gay and lesbian uh, bills that come to us every single session. But once they understand that they are not going to be made a special class of persons, uh, they kind of understand that we have to make our discrimination laws work better than what they are, or enforced better than what they are, and not just keep piling on more and more regulations and rules because we can make laws till we have reams and reams of paper and we don't have anything changing. The issues with transgenders in high schools is uh, I feel that it is the parents responsibility to, to oversee the minors in all of these situations. It is not necessarily the school's responsibility to be held liable for those. Okay, uh, there is, I've had emails coming to me saying, well, what about uh, the concerns of that individual having to be worried about their own uh, parents, if the parents find out about if they're, what they are, if they're transgender or not. You know what? Uh, that's the first person that they should be going to. If there is a problem with those people, those persons, uh, the parents, uh, then there's other ways to handle that. The school should not be the ones that are held accountable for those kinds of actions. That's not the place for that. They're, going, they're absolutely a supportive uh, means for that, but they are not the ones that should be held accountable. And those administrators pointed that out to me because they are kind of between a rock and a hard place. How do they handle this if there's a lawsuit? Um, I feel that um, and I know many, I have uh, uh, gays in my family, uh, but I just, uh, it's not up to us to uh, regulate that stuff, and we need to make sure that we treat these people of any genders with respect and love and attention, and uh, whether it is a uh, social issue or as a medical issue that's something that um, damning them is not what we need to do and I'm not for that at all 
Um, the meal, the meal situation, the six million dollar on six million dollar bill on the meals. The very same day that we had that six million dollar bill, there was another bill that uh, absolutely um, was to eliminate shaming that's going on in schools, and uh, it's going on in schools. And I don't know if it's happening here in Hankinson, but it's going in schools that is very close to Hankinson, and. Uh, my uh, family members have told me this. They are handed, these kids are handed a brown paper bag with a peanut butter sandwich in it, with an apple and a cheese stick in it. Completely separate from the other line of, uh, of uh, kids getting their plates. There, were other, there was talk on the Senate side about funding school lunches 100%, not just up to 200 percent of poverty level and that is still a possibility however uh, going up when you start setting precedences of uh, going above what uh, federal standards of 130 percent is now there's going to be other programs that that's going to have some uh, uh, contributions or some complications for so uh, I think that if we were to fund school lunches 100%, maybe that's not just a bad idea, but uh, the shaming part has got to go away, it's got to be stopped. And uh, there's, I believe there's federal guidelines on that, but there are schools that are not adhering to that either. I'm sorry, Terry, what was the rest of those? Uh, again, it was mostly about local controls, uh, okay. books and libraries, local water policy. So it, it covered a lot of things, but it was I think the question okay. is still about local control. Got it. Library issue. I didn't have this in Wapiton, but I, I don't know if I should read some of these to you or what I should do with these, but I have five books here that these are just excerpts out of those books, and they are in the children's sections of these local libraries. And... Uh, you know what? I'm going to read something to you. Yeah, we, do. we don't have to do that. I don't. I think Please it's don't. Please come and take a look at this. This is absolutely pornographic and obscene. And this is in our public libraries and the kids' sections. And anybody who says that this is not uh, a problem, they have a problem. And I'm serious about that. There's other graphs up here that we had testimony on about how pornographic material stifles and screws up little kids' brains and how true it is. And it doesn't correct itself. So if you think that putting these books in uh, these kids' reach is okay, I have a problem with that. The state library State, excuse me, the state librarian stood 10 feet away from me at the podium and uh, was just adamant that none of the material that she has ever seen has been, is pornographic. And I, I almost tipped over. I said, are you, what kind of silliness is this? There's a difference, though, between pornographic and or obscene. You have to understand that. And what's pornographic to me may not be pornographic to Mrs. Hardy here. May not be, may not be pornographic to Mr. Pervy. Okay? And that's the loophole that's there. So we have to get to a point where we identify pornographic material to obscene material and make sure that that is not banned from the libraries. Don't, I am not interested in doing any of that banning stuff that's being talked about. Not in my eyes, not I don't, I don't know as if I've ever seen a book that I, should, uh, that I would say that should be banned from a book, from a library, but make sure that's in the proper section. That's it. I'd just Great. like to add, I think this is just, this is the rabbit hole that the North Dakota legislature has gone down. And this is not, I don't think, what anybody sent us out to Bismarck to do. I mean, funding roads and bridges and school, Schools, I, this is the sideshow that's gone on. It's really disappointing. And I, I need to add to the comment, you know, that I have zero tolerance for lunch shaming, but my friend sponsored that bill. 
The big, the big issue is who's going to pay for these lunches? I mean, school budgets are stretched, and, and so that wasn't even addressed in that lunch shaming bill. So is it going to be the schools that have to pay for the lunches that the kids can't afford? Is it charities? Or are, are parents still going to be sent to collections? And that wasn't addressed in that bill. So, yeah, I, I, I'm disappointed in the school lunches because it's to me, I mean, Kids shouldn't have to start the school day or go through the school day hungry because we know hunger is hidden in North Dakota. And all you got to do is go talk to the people that volunteer at food pantries. And it's not the people that are, aren't working, but it's, um, it's people that can't stretch their budget. So I'm disappointed in that. And then book banning. Representative Armstrong said to me, Congressman Armstrong, he said, book banning has never worked in the history of the world. And I think we're naive if we think that. Um, I'm on the Friends of the Library um, a membership, and this is the biggest threat to our young people is the access of information online. I, I'm scared and frightened by that, and I really don't think it's our, our library, so that's just my comment. Okay, do we have any other written questions? Okay. Chad, you had a comment? Yeah, this is our superintendent follow up, here. <clears throat> follow up on the, the lunch thing there. Um, in Hankinson, we don't shame our kids. Thank um, you. We feed them. And if they can't afford the meal, I don't care. We're feeding them anyway. Thank you. And we'll figure out where we're going to find the money to feed them. Uh, it's not the kids' fault if the parents aren't paying the bills. And, I'm, and some of these kids, it's their only good meal they have in the day. So we're, we're feeding them. I don't care. Um, the one thing I didn't like about that bill, at least initially, I'm not sure if it's still in there, is that it restricted schools from taking some of those unpaid bills to collections. <clears throat> and if you take that off the table, um, there is no threat for anybody to have to pay the garbage bill. So there has to be a tool that's available to schools to still do that. Um, supporting free lunches, we have a system in place already that helps with school lunches. Um, I'm okay with changing the levels of that. Do I think that every kid needs to have their lunch paid for every day? Not necessarily. I don't need my kids to have lunch paid for. But that level could have been increased. And when you say no to raising that level, you're, you're taking, you could put money back into the pockets of the neediest families in our state by raising that level. We, we have families every year that just miss that threshold and don't qualify for even reduced meals. But then if you turn around and you take public money and subsidize private schools to the level of 500% of the poverty level, you're now, you're now putting money back into the pockets of the least neediest people in the state. And it just doesn't make sense in my mind. And I'm not saying that all of you are voting for these bills or, or against them. Um, you represent us out there. We don't always agree with every vote that you make and every decision that you make, but we also understand that. But when you're here, you're also representing the legislature. Um, and it's, I really, I don't know if I've ever been as disappointed in a session as I have this year. Um, it's, it's hurtful. A lot of things that are going on out there to a lot of people. And uh, I, I don't know where it's going to go, but um, I we talk about local control, and I don't see that. That's not how the legislature as a whole votes. They, they, they vote that they're the smartest people in the room, and they know best about what we need in our community when they're not in our community. So You know, and I can comment on that, Chad, and I appreciate your comments because I, I was um, an, over an hour debate on the floor on private school funding, and at 500%, but you look at it over an hour debate, and there's no data, not one piece of data that says that we should be doing this. There's no control other than an audit. And I, I, but it's a national, if you look at nationally, that's a trend nationally. So whatever we've seen and spent our time on is a national trend, whether it be libraries, whether it be transgender pronoun issues, whether it be, um, the private school funding, we need to do some research. And, and these things, I mean, the teachers that I'm speaking with and, and the administrators, they don't see an issue. And if there is, they'd rather take it at a local control level. 
And I, and I wholeheartedly believe that every community is different and local control is extremely important. But we can't sell that anymore, apparently, in the legislature. I want to chime in a little bit on that, though. Um, I think that the attitude that I think I hear, and I'm for local control as well, uh, if things are being handled properly, like the county issues with county not getting along with the next county, and it's been going on for so many years that uh, there's just no hope to getting things fixed, that's when the state has to step in. What I, uh, in the educational area or arena, I would say that that local control is failing by our education numbers. That's where the state is getting worried because we are bombarded with uh, uh, requests of, of uh, you know, doing what this, this uh, um, $24 million for private schools and charter schools and homeschooling and school vouchers and money following the students, all of that comes down to why are we sitting down here with these uh, grade points and not letting the parents uh, be involved more with their education of their own children. That's, that is a big issue. I'm not on education, but I'm in just... Uh, uh, hearing the complaints and concerns that I uh, am bringing to you, so. Okay. We're going to move on to another question. H Bill HB 1391 mandates more spending by local water boards without providing any state funding. Can this bill be fixed in conference committee to have funding? And 1391, is that the man, is that the uh, minute draft minutes? Yeah, one? you want me to add some more to sure. that? Yeah, that, that was the bill that was in, when it was originally introduced <clears throat> on the House side, said that they had to have their minutes <clears throat> published in 72 hours. And that got amended to 10 days, as Senator Lewick mentioned. So that, that was sort of an agreement that everybody thought they could live with. And they could do it either online or in their, publish it in their paper. When it got over to the Senate, the Senate said they had to do both. And the estimates of like, Cass County is about $20,000 a year, uh, Ward County about $10,000 a year. It seems to me it's going to be statewide about a half a million dollars a year of extra spending that can only be provided by taxing property. The state imposes this cost on the local units of government, provides no money, and then criticizes the local units for spending too much money. So, you know, they should either fund it. I mean, I, I think the version that came out of the House, which said you do either one, do it online or do it in the papers, but publish the, and get it within 10 days. Now, that was kind of a negotiated settlement between the parties. But it gets to the Senate, and they said, no, you have to do both, which now means... So, I mean, I understand as, as of Thursday noon, the bill was still alive, and it had gone over to the House, and they were trying to get it into conference committee. So I was hoping that over on the House side... They can get that fixed. It is, Courtney. I just, you know, tried to look it up to see where it's at, and you're right. It's, it's going to be in conference committee. Okay. They didn't concur, so mm -hmm. that will be in a conference committee. Well, from what I just read. People that are involved yeah. in, in that. Is it going to be it, a house, an agricultural? No, no. Um, no. So <laughs> house Energy and Natural Resources okay. uh, and Senate. Uh, you, you have that on the Senate side. We have it. But on the House side, it's not. It was in Natural Resources. Oh, okay. That's one of the problems we have is that there seems to be some cross committees going yeah. on in our system this year. Um, are you required to post those minutes as it is in the paper? I, I don't think there's a current requirement to post the minutes in the paper. I don't know, but I, I guess not since this bill. You know. Somebody should know. Well, yes. Our Water Resource Board here in Mr. <coughs> County uh, posts ours on our website. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they're only on always, the website. Always available on our website, and uh, <coughs> I would think if anybody is interested is, is, is interested in water resource board uh, business and work, that they're going to be tuned in to coming on to our website to uh, to okay. post read the <coughs> minutes there, and uh, the average person uh, reading the paper, I don't think is going to care whether the water resource minutes are in the paper. And I have no problem with that. That the language in there doesn't mandate that it is in both, because <coughs> a lot of boards don't have a virtual way to get their minutes. 
So, but we were told that it is mandated, this come from legislative council, that it is mandated in some other code somewhere that it, that, man, that minutes are mandated to be printed in the paper. That's where that come from. And so then we put in the word, if applicable in that language. So if you had a website, then you could post it there as well. If you did not have a website, you didn't have to. We just extended it to 10 days rather than the 72 hours like it come out. Well, then could you yeah. use language in the, in the bill that would say either or? Yes, we can. All right, that's yeah. the way to do it. And we took off the 30-day for um, um, appeals off of that because that would contradict what else is in the code in other sections of code. Okay. All the comments? Okay. Any other uh, any other written questions? Otherwise, we'll go to open form. Keith? Uh, Terry, this is more of a thank you for worship from over here at Summit Township um, by Great Bend. Uh, I just want to personally thank Alyssa for working with providing additional funding for snow removal this morning uh, in the townships, <laughs> county, and municipalities. <coughs> Our township doesn't financially have the resources. <coughs> this time I think we've seen the maintainer six or seven times because because of that and uh, I think all of us that live in the country uh, you know, need to appreciate that plus make sure you thank your maintainers that are out there on the county roads and township thank these guys they've had a tough winter I wish it was more money. Thank the utility yeah. Keeping our power. Yeah, it, it's been quite a... Um, uh, you know, and it's not over yet. We don't know how much water is going to yeah. come from the west on the wild rice. Yeah, that's where the problem is going to be. But thank you. Okay, any comments on that? I wish there were more money because it, it's not enough, but it, it at least will help. And it's been quite a team effort from, you know, DOT to county folks and farmers and township, you know, just everybody volunteering and so yeah, tough winter. Okay, I've got, uh, did we really hit on Prairie Dog very much or what is the possibilities of Prairie Dog getting <laughs> changed back the or Let's eliminating that 180 million in front of it? I mean, What's the we're in uh, worse shape than we were. Yeah. I know we got no. rolled, no. but can we, can we, is there still an opportunity to take that out? Is there an opportunity for the prairie dog bucket to get moved up yet? We are still working on that. Okay. It's not a done deal yet. Terry, with that, why do we always rely on oil and the prairie dog, and it's so cyclical? In six legislative sessions, Richland County received prairie dog funding one time. Right. And with that, every other county does, and then the contractors are too busy, and they just jack their aids up. In 2013, there was $600 million in the fuel tax. In 2023, there's $500 million. So we went down 20% for our funding, but yet our projects have tripled in price. Why not take some of that interest from the legacy fund, use the Upper Great Plains Transportation Study, and have an allocation per year so counties can plan, contractors can plan and set up, <clears throat> and so there's a consistency rather than going the cyclical Prairie dog based off of whatever. Yeah, prairie dog, I mean, in its, oh, great concept, right? <laughs> if there's just tons of extra running. But it doesn't work. You can't, I agree, 100%. You cannot plan. So whether or not, and I used to sit on aeronautics, and we were, the, we were at the tail, tail end. So we can't even, because in that case, aeronautics relies on federal funding, but they've, they have to have the dollars in place. Federal is about 90% of a project on federal airports. Well, if you don't know if you're going to get the money, you can't, I mean, you can't even plan. So it is not, it's really a nice concept, but it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So so I, I'm extremely disappointed. There was some sneaky legislation that took place on that bucket, the realignment, and Prairie Dog slid down, and um, more money went into the 458 for the social service funding. You know, the, the state pays for social service administration. So more money went in that, but Prairie Dog slid down. So I immediately talked to members of the DOT budget committee, and they're working on 
stay tuned. It's it's pretty early yet, and it'll get hashed out in conference committee, but they, they're working on trying to get more money out to the counties and townships. Brandenburg knows it's an issue, and he's extremely disappointed. So I apologize. That's not my budget, but there are rural legislators that are working hard to try to address the needs. Cause, yeah. With that, I do want to thank the support for the infrastructure loan through the Bank of North Dakota. It looked like it was going to get cut. You guys were able to accept $150 million for that. Mm -hmm. Ankinson has been a recipient of that on the north side in, in their development. It's really needed for smaller communities, especially with that 2% over 30 years. So thank you for that. So the Senate, though, disappointingly enough, they reduced the, um, the funding I had um, inserted into the Commerce budget for rural housing. And so they knocked it down to $2 million, which they can't even, Commerce is telling me now they can't even implement the program. So conference committee, again, it's, that's when we, you know, start fighting and we'll, we'll try to get that restored and. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions from someone? Other issue? Go ahead. Terry. My name is Adam Whaler. I guess I have a question as it pertains to uh, some of the child care related bills that were put forward. A couple comments were even noted on that in the opening remarks, um, specifically 2301, Senate Bill 2301, and some, I think there was three or four, maybe other bills that tried to tackle that, that issue. Um, if I could, Terry, could I take just a few minutes maybe to give some background as to where this question comes from? Um, so I'm, I'm uh, Elder at Emanuel Lutheran Church here and I'm the Board of Directors for our Child Care Center here in town, a beautiful facility that we were able to build. In 2016, uh, we wrote a grant to the state at that time, I think it was $187,500 if I remember right, which obviously helped us tremendously to get that facility started. Since then, we've been operating um, 40 kids, 42 kids in enrollment. I think we're licensed for 60, which is great for a community this size. 2021, of course, with COVID, you know, the grants, that stabilization grant that was given, we use that entirely to uh, lift uh, salaries for our staff, as well as try to keep tuition rates manageable for parents, right? So it's a juggling act. It's, it's really tough running a business like that. We're a non-for-profit. Um, we've been monitoring that all the way through 21, 22, uh, acknowledging that this may not continue, and of course it, it didn't. Um, 2301 seemed like it tried to tackle that. It's in principle, certainly less dollars than what we were getting the year prior. Um, so now obviously we're juggling with the fact that you're not just going to miraculously lower salaries, nor do we want to. And so we're stuck really with raising tuition rates tremendously. Or, and there's really no other expenses to manage other than salaries, unfortunately. Food's expensive and so on. So it's a challenge, right? And we are, our board is, this is our main topic for this year, to figure out how to balance our budget now that the grant doesn't exist. So. Yeah, so 2301, a friend of mine, and I'm a co-sponsor on that bill, um, it's really disappointing, but I, quite a quite a, a battle within the Department of Human Services. They, they, they felt that stabilization wasn't utilized properly by all providers. I think you're a great example, and I, I fought and argued with them, but they said there were some abuses, that it wasn't used to, you know, raise salaries and stabilize, you know, their the workforce. and. So that's kind of been taken off the table, but there is a standalone bill that we'll, you'll hear about this this week in the, um, I think in the media, but it's it's proposing about $85 million for, you know, helping to increase slots and increase funding rather for zero to three, in, in for that in particular in the infant area where it's a higher cost to provide that, and um, background checks to to expedite that, and there's a whole. There's a numerous issues, and I can visit with you afterwards about the specifics of that bill. But um, they know we know that we've got to do something, and it's not enough. Um, but it's a start, and it, I think it's it's an issue facing most working North Dakota families. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's coming straight. And it, it Unfortunately, we're anything? right yeah. at the yeah, tipping point of trying to figure out these budgets for everything. We are. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were 1.7 billion in uh, upside down, and uh, we're getting a little closer now. But we haven't got that much time left to uh, get this finalized. So it's going to be quite a chore for appropriations to get this handled. Was there a bill number for that one established yet? Uh, it just was assigned, and so I think you'll hear about it on Monday. I don't remember the bill number. Yeah, it's delayed bill. Too. It's Red, delayed uh, bill. Red River. Thank you. Um, communications. 
first of all, to the representatives and the senator, thank you for coming and sitting in front of us this morning. The, the issue I'd like to discuss is broadband funding. I think it's starting to make the news quite a bit, and you're hearing about that. When we talk about the broadband funding, the reason I'm here is for rural Wapita, the rural Dwight area. Um, there's appropriations. Right now it's tied to House Bill 1021, but there's appropriations going on. And uh, on the Senate side, they tried to pull federal funding that was given to the state, dedicated for broadband. And right now, there's uh, specifically on the Senate side, there's senators that are trying to pull up that funding and go to career technical academies. And that's leaving a huge gap in Richland County where people cannot get internet. Now the irony is those career and technical academies are supposed to train people who work from at home. And people can't work from at home if they don't have good broadband. My ask is of you, is please any appropriations tied to the state ITD and specifically broadband, please stand up before you, you vote and make sure you specifically ask, is there the funding in there? Just, just to follow up because we saw what day did I see you? I can't remember when. Tuesday or Wednesday? I did go to the governor's office and speak with Jace, and he hasn't gotten back to me yet. But I brought up exactly this scenario, and so we're hoping. And I appreciate you stopped by and found us that day. So, Tom, I never been. Oh, it's another disappointment. But yeah, forty-five million dollars appropriation or a grant right, from grant. the federal government. Federal government. Yeah. Yeah. And state IT is just, they have all this money and all this power and we, we all these huge budgets that are in front of us and you would not believe the amount of money that's going to state IT. I mean, we need, we need, we can't live without them, but they have so much power and for them to be, be sitting on this money, it's unacceptable. And then for other um, legislators to think that they're gonna dip into that and re reappropriate other than its intended use, it's very troubling. So I don't know if you're having any, if there's a plan to bombard um, the legislature with emails or phone calls from your membership, yeah. it'd be very helpful. Because yeah. the governor's office, I mean, it's been on deaf ears. And I don't, I don't know. Well, I'm supposed to have an, an, IT an, guy. To have an answer well, back. Unfortunately, <laughs> that, it, I mean, it should, it should come into your realm here, but it's, it doesn't seem to be uh, catching hold. My questions are for Senator Lewick. Uh, a couple of questions. First off, on the school lunch bill. Um, you know, Superintendent Benson is saying in Hankinson they don't, they don't do that. They call it shame and call it whatever. I thank him for that. But somebody's <coughs> paying for that. And I don't know that anybody in this room uh, really would look at themselves and say I'm paying too little in property taxes. And of course, uh, Superintendent Benson is one of the big uh, recipients of your property tax dollars. And so with a state that has, and I'm sorry, we keep talking about we're, we're broke, we're broke, we're not broke. The state of North Dakota has money. They have money. Money that was put into funds that was supposed to go towards building North Dakota for the future. And so my question for Senator Louie is why? Why, if, if you're sitting there saying, okay, we have a situation where people are pushing for 100% payment of hot lunch programs, offer the amendment. You could have done that from the floor. Stand up on the floor, make the amendment. Instead, vote against it. Now, why? Because it seems to me that, and believe me, it happens. I had a cook from Kindred come up to me and say, you have to make this an issue, Joel. You have to because I'm not shaming these kids. You know, this is, this is ridiculous. And so the state has the money, we have the ability, and yet you voted against it. And I think we all deserve to know what you're doing to make sure it gets paid. Uh, I, there's nothing I can do to make sure it gets paid. I know that I'm on uh, the side where we feel that there was other options coming at us, and we needed to see that first. The bill that was also issued on the floor that day was the anti-shaming bill. Now, and that passed, I think, almost unanimously, if not unanimously. The federal guidelines on, um, on uh, poverty levels 
raising that to 200 percent. We felt that there was going to be some issues with uh, it affecting other state and federal programs where the 200 or the uh, 500 percent of the uh, of the of the next bill the um, uh, funding for private schools that was just way out of line I don't know who thought or dreamt that up that's the reason I voted against that thing in a big way uh, that is not proper in my eyes whatsoever um, but I it's think not that it's, it's not happening. It's it, not. it got defeated. And it that's did. my point. My point is, when you ran for office, the one thing that you made crystal clear was that you were a leader in the Republican caucus. Part of your brochure and everything was that you were president pro tem of the Senate. Yes. Which means that within your caucus, your caucus respected you enough to make you one of their leaders. Which, yes. quite frankly, having served there, I respect. What I'm saying is, if you're a leader in their caucus, why didn't you stand up, take it on, get these things funded, and vote for it instead of against it? Mr. Heitkamp, I didn't even know about that until it come uh, just a short time before. We never even had a caucus in between then. And That's furthermore... Your it's your job to know what, what's coming on the floor. It's your job to know what you're voting on, what you can make amendments on. I don't think you realize how busy I am out there, Joel. I, I think I do, I serve. <laughs> <laughs> I have been absolutely strapped from the minute I walk in that door from about 6 o'clock in the morning until I leave at 6 at night or later at night. And uh, there's no lunch time, there's nothing. And uh, for me to uh, isolate each and every one of these bills and uh, see like a thousand emails a day come through there and that canned email stuff ought to be outlawed, uh, but nevertheless, I, I, what I, the way that I vote is I look at the information that I have at the time and uh, whether it's good for uh, Richland County and District 25 and or if it's good for the state of North Dakota, I have to weigh that all out. And I promise you I do that on every bill. Now, if that information is not complete, I can't, I can't make that proper judgment, maybe. But on the Senate, you can make a floor amendment. That's the beauty of serving in the Senate. You, you can make a floor amendment. And if you're part of leadership, which you said you were, then you can go back, you can pull it off the table, you can pull it off until you know what it is, you can move it to the bottom of the calendar. There's a million steps you can use to make sure that that bill has, you have the opportunity to come with a red envelope and offer an amendment. And I want to go back to this, because the 500% level for the private schools, the private school funding passed. Now, I recognize that, that you voted against it, but I want to go back to the leadership issue, which is, were there amendments offered on the floor? Did you talk to your caucus? Once they get funded, and, and you mentioned earlier the Catholic Conference and how you work closely with the Catholic Conference. The Catholic Conference, which I'm Catholic, is the ones that are pushing for private school funding. They are. And the one thing that I will guarantee this room is that once they get funded, once they get these voucher bills, the next session it'll do more. Which is exactly what happened with the oil tax breaks that you guys passed. You gave the oil tax industry a tax break when they were making record profits, and then the next time you came back, you took the cap off that so they got even more tax breaks. That's what's gonna happen with these vouchers for private schools. And, and again, you got the opportunity to amend on the floor, and as a leader, Take these guys out of the caucus and stand and speak, Larry. Uh, Joel, how did I vote on both of those? Well, you voted no on the private schools. Both of them. You said you're a leader in your caucus. Well, I'm no your longer the president pro tem. There's okay. been two pro tems since me. All right? Uh, but the thing is, is that uh, when you get, there's two things I'm up against here. One is that rural versus urban, and east versus west. And uh, like it or not, in a split district like uh, Richland County and District 25 is, uh, we are always challenging something, one place or another. And uh, it's just like having four Democrats in the, in the, in the, co in the Senate floor. It's not right. It's not enough. I know that. 
because we don't have. We don't in have fairness, enough. you guys put a lot of money in to make sure that happens. But that, that, that being said, uh, you know. My Here's what I mean by that, Joel. I serve. Here's what I mean I by that. Oh, stop. Let's stop places. right here. Let's stop right here. We These questions are supposed to be so all can respond. So I'm going to ask you to finish up your comment, Joel. Well, my comment we, is We this. need to move on. Did you stand on the floor and take on the funding of private schools? No, I did not. Okay. Thank you, Terry. Yep. Lanny Whaler, and thank you also for being here, everybody. Um, book bans aren't the appropriate things, but... Can I put a request into Senator Lou to read one of the copies that you have from some of the library content? I think of my head. How about if you come in with him? Take it, you yeah. can read it. No, okay. I'd like everybody else in the room to hear it. Uh, some are uncomfortable with that, so we don't want it. So, some people here are not comfortable with so that. So if we aren't comfortable, why are our kids? I, that's something you should one on one with Larry. No, He's got I want everybody in the community to hear um, what our kids are reading. This is an excellent yeah. point. Yeah. Well, this forum is about issues and that's trying to find disgusting. out what they're doing and what we can do. Um, that's a very specific request of some material, and I, I don't think that's what we're here for. It's there. So, what go I, ahead. I have a question, um, and Ms. Wheeler? Um, Wheeler. Wheeler. I'm sorry. And I'm, I, maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're saying, but you're assuming that this is mandatory reading? Or Not mandatory, but how but often in public schools, um, I have four kids, one is a seventh grader, how often do those kids typically bring books home to read? We, um, we can't supervise the school library. Have you, read, have you read every book that your child has read? Well, I don't have any children right now. We so, can lock down um, our cell phones. I, I would address that again, it's a local control issue, mm -hmm. and you have your administrator right here, and we at the state level, I'm probably not going to get to your library to look at what your mater the materials are in your school library or even a public library. So I would address that. That's a local control issue that the state should not be interfering with in my mind. So I, I'm, you're here, so I, I think that that would be a question that, and, and that's for afterwards, obviously, but um, that, that's where the question should be, at not to the state. It's, it's not our purview, I don't believe. So I would definitely go to your local administrator or your local library, and I think they're all boards and um, school boards uh, uh, are the people that hire or go to your school board because they're, they're an elected official and you have probably more pull with them than, than uh, at, at the state level. It's a national, it's a national, this has been a national um, in, oversight to bring this bill to every state in the country and cause, you know, parental, you know, it's not any about parental rights. You have your rights. Your child does not have to read anything. You can opt out of anything in a school if I'm, it's already in code. So check I, with your I local do, officials. I do appreciate that. And like I said, yep. I don't Thank agree you. with the book ban, but um, I do think <coughs> that people should be aware of the content that our children are being exposed to. We should be concerned about phones, of course. Um, but, I mean, just yesterday, Thursday, I was at Story Hour in our library, and there's a whole graphic novel series titled Assassination Teacher. Um, sending our kids to school now is, you know, we don't have, we have locked doors, we don't have security officers, but when you have a whole graphic novel series called Assassination Teacher, um, it makes you kind of question what is being put into our kids' minds. Um, I can guarantee 10, 15, 20 years down the road, mental health is continuing to see an increase. Um, we're just going to see more and more of those things going up because of the content that our young kids are being exposed to. So I compliment you being an interested parent. Yeah, we need but more. What about the ones that aren't? Well, and, well, and my fear yeah. is, I mean, <laughs> nothing in this bill talked about really the true threat to our children is <laughs> online, social media, cell phones, and, and, you know, the exposure to, you know, violence and different ideas and whether it be illicit material and I, I I think that's the biggest threat facing our children is that cyber world, it's virtual world and yeah, online. You're still fund the library. Yeah. You're funding the library. Yeah. So I mean, what, is, what are you doing? I mean, sure you're staying with all this stuff, but you're still funding the library. And the state should have some uh, some yeah, authority over it. Some say about what you're funding. Yes. You can't be assassinating teachers and, 
and writing dirty, dirty stuff like that, and expect a kid to come out of that uh, 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 with some respect. Exactly. <coughs> Julie? Um, libraries have selection policies in place, as far as I remember, and they also have reconsideration policies, so I'm not familiar with at all with that series, okay? Um, but what happens is if a parent or an adult is not satisfied, like in Valley City, and I could be wrong with the one graphic novel that was there, um, they filled out the reconsideration form with the public library, and then the committee, uh, committee, I believe of parents and people, other people in the community, they read the book and then they decided that no, they wanted to move it to the adult section. And so it was kind of a local government being in control of it. And picking out books is a very, very difficult <coughs> process. You need to read a lot of reviews before you pick out books. And um, mistakes may be made, but it is a public library. Um, now schools can be different. And, and, um, and then if you don't like something, read the material approach the librarian, um, fill out the reconsideration form, and go through the process. And then if you're still not satisfied with it, see what else can be done. Okay. My only concern and with that is, is that um, there's some corruption, I think, with the American Library Association and how that they're rating books currently. Um, so a series that was rated for 12 and up for my daughter, I had decided to read just to see what kind of content it was. A lot of sexual things for a 12 year old. Um, promoting sex before marriage. Very detailed description on different sexual things. So that's where some of the concern comes because it gets into the youth section because it's rated for 12 and up. So unless if I'm going to read every single book in the library, how am I going to submit some of those things? Or it is difficult and, and I understand that, that that's probably the way to go about it, but it's just hard to read all that material. One last thing. <laughs> Normally when a librarian picks out books, and it, it's not easy, okay? Mm -hmm. But you have a, a whole, you, you have your own little regional group, okay? Of people, what they like. For instance, um, when I was in the school, we could not keep Harry Potter on the shelf. We were constantly replacing it. When I substituted at another school for two weeks, I finally looked at the circulation. They weren't reading that because it's a regional thing. Now, the American Library Association, that is one place that reviews and um, sets standards for books and reviews. But normally, there's like five or six um, book lists, the library journal. I can't remember all the rest of them, OK? I'm old. Um, and you look at all those reviews when you're picking out books. And as a librarian, I did target certain books and purchase them for certain students that I thought would like them. <coughs> and um, a librarian does the best they can, but you, you have a wide variety of audience there. And it, there is a, a parent has to take some type of um, guidance, I think, in picking out books. Okay. Thank you. Thank you guys you. have any comments at all on any of uh, our local <coughs> school board has a policy dictating instructional materials and reviewing it. I'm from Wapiton Public Schools. I'm an elementary principal and director of special services. And I'm uh, assuming you have the same policy, Chad. Um, and, and it is, you know, I approve the books, requisitions, those kinds of things. My librarian is professional. All of those procedures are in place. And I always welcome patrons, you know, if they have a, a wondering about that. Um, I believe our librarian, too, Mine is um, a Minnesota resident, Tina Grenier, but I believe there would be a, a online resource. We have a, it's all online. What books are available in Wapaton Public Schools libraries? Um, we have, I think, two librarians in our district. So I have not received. I've only been an administrator for 13 years, but I've never received a complaint about our content in our library. So I, I feel great about that. But if I do, you know. I, I would certainly address it and follow our school district policy, which is adopted by our school board. Okay, thank you. David. Question back to public versus private schools, and correct me if I'm wrong, but is the funding in pretty much in place to put some money into funding private schools? The governor hasn't signed 
the well but it looks like it's headed that direction it's going to the governor whether right. or not yeah. i i don't have an indication of whether then my question <coughs> my question in regards to that is so when when kids go to a public education system no matter where it is they whoever enters that door whether they're handicapped slow learning whatever excellent teacher way above learning whatever a public school system has to accept them am i correct correct yes when they go to a private system is that law still in effect no no and then why are we funding it are we saying our public education is not good I, i'm not saying that and well, I, somebody I, is. yeah i know we i i spoke against um on the debate and, we might as well kick it all off the road because if, if we're going to start funding public ed private education we we are in re in, in yeah. retrospect saying our public education system isn't good enough great well what we're funding is choice and we and we write all new guidelines 500 percent of the federal poverty level to go to a private school i my I, folks sent me to a private school they scrimped and saved to send right. us we didn't complain about it yes, and nowadays we're supposed to fund that it was really i agree with and you dave i think that the reasoning behind a lot of this is some of this stuff right here well but break the same laws break i'm the not same, kidding you break the same rules for public schools as for private schools don't give i, I get that goal, goal i get that no i didn't approve of that either well somebody but, did i get it it's but, dave like, it's a national it's national it's yes. a national bent that all states now are starting or have and are starting to fund private schools which um so does that is, mean we have to join the band <laughs> no that's exactly what i'm saying is all these have come down that it's a national bent and they pick up on the national bent i absolutely could not believe the members of the house that voted for that I absolutely could not believe it well and i i I'm My point is still the same. Once we open that door oh, yeah. and no, start I, putting I, one I, funding in there, wait until next legislative session. And Keith, you had a question others. or a comment? Yeah. Does anybody know the constitutionality yeah, of this well, bill? I believe that that might be challenged. If it is challenged, then we provide taxpayers' dollars then to defend it. No, no, you know, yes, 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 well, yes, the, yes, on yes, the defense side, yes. So, yes. thank uh, you for again, asking that. We're yeah. spending $10 million. So during, to so provide funding for private schools, and then we're going to, and then, and then we're going to defend. Unless the governor has some bravado and vetoes it. Well, I would be emailing the governor's office. I would everybody and thirty of your friends um, against that bill because I don't I don't know how he stands on that. Thank you. Anybody know the bill number on um, We'll find out. We'll get yeah, the bill 1532. number. Yeah, 1532. <laughs> okay. The other side of that coin is. is that uh, the private school uh, parents are saying, well, then why are we paying our property taxes to the county? They go That's their choice, Larry. Yeah. They do That's have a choice. choice. Yeah. Nobody's forcing. Well, well, I will please, give please raise your hand if we've got several people that have raised their hand. Let so me let's give take you, it in line. I, I, you know, on the property tax issue, that is what, and I'm on the education committee, I heard parent after parent after parent talk to the property tax issue about they send their child to private school. Well, so I took, uh, I, went, I went and found some information looking at Fargo and Bismarck actually, looking at a $200,000 home. I don't know if they exist anymore, but a $200,000 home. The percentage of the property tax that was going into that home, into school, was basically under $1,000, right around that $900 figure. It's between 40 and 50% yeah. of their tax liability, right? Um, so this bill at 500, that 500% level would be three times that parent is getting three times what that property tax payment is because the estimate based on what the numbers are at that 500 percent right now is each parent or each school per student would receive around three thousand dollars based on all the videos i watched and that was the estimate that the child would um, get the benefit of three thousand dollars per child at that 500 percent of poverty level i don't argue against that Larry. my point my point to all this is we have a lot of people sitting in this room that don't have kids in school never had kids right and are I funding agree. education a hell of a lot more than that house owner is 
Exactly. Not complaining about it. Oh, no, I agree 100%. And my other point is if you're going to establish guidelines for public schools, then impose the same ones on the private school system. Exactly. And there they are just private don't schools. have the accountability what? factors that we have. So, again, as special education director, I'm required to give a proportionate share of my federal funds to the private school to serve students with disabilities there. When the disability becomes too great, you're right, they must come back to public. So thank you for increasing the funding factor for special education because the complexity of disabilities is increasing. And this is the first time that that funding factor in your formula has increased in many, many years. So thank you for that. But it's just difficult for me to manage the increasing complexity of serving students and then less funding to do so. That funding could have went to transportation or, or to school lunches or something. The reality is, is I'm required by federal law to locate as many students with delays as I can and start serving them as soon as possible. We did that on March 23rd. 30% of our four-year-olds were detected to have a delay. And those are for the parents that brought their children there, you know? I have a, a huge responsibility to protect the most vulnerable people here in our society, the elderly, the, the children, all of that. And it's, it's like if they're hungry, they can't learn. And then I have Senate, you know, House Bill 1388, the science of reading. I'm supposed to be coaching this. Then I'm supposed to be calling and collecting lunch bills. I do all of that. I'll work until my job's done. And I'll, I'll, I'll do that. That's who I am. Uh, but I need more help. And, and thank you for getting these funding factors increased. It's 62,000 right now for Wapaton Public Schools, just for special needs students. I have 175 right now that I serve. Okay. You know, there's an interesting uh, dynamic to that. Um, back into the special ed funding. Mm -hmm. With that, there's already 24 million sitting there. Um, that is really for high dollar students. And yes. not necessarily, but we're not utilizing all those dollars. So in my thought, when that percentage was, or the, the factor was increased for special ed, in all reality, we don't track it. So it just basically goes into the major funding anyway. So my idea is to, if you're going to do that, do a percentage increase that would make a lot of teachers feel a lot better because we have really been difficult on teachers. Terribly difficult. Uh, it's embarrassment. And so just blend that into the percentage and basically if you need to beef up that $24 million, let's do that and write a little bit of policy in there that you guys can utilize that. And then we know the schools that need it are going to get it. There's schools that may not need it. And right now we're just assuming that everybody's just going to increase that. So I've been speaking with appropriations of the E&E division on the house side to change that and look at that a little differently. Besides that, once that is in the percentage factor, we still have the 70% of that increase going to teacher salaries. I think that would be very beneficial, just just from a mental state of teachers, because they're in the same situation our kids are. Larry, you have, we're going to maybe make a comment on the education thing. I was. Okay. Thank you, George. <laughs> I wanted to point out that it isn't only the property taxes that that uh, these dollars go to private schools or you know that they are complaining about. <clears throat> it's also their income taxes and their sales taxes and any other tax that the state collects that is considered public tax dollars. Not just property taxes is what I wanted to say. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Adam, you had your hand up or did I'm you get it covered? Some of my we got it covered? Okay. Great. Great. Is there another issue yet? We've got maybe one more issue we could cover. Arnie? How about the legacy fund? Are you guys invested in China yet? <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know that. Um, you know, that's this just like when you're investing in a, um, not an individual company, but you take a retirement or whatever and it's invested, mm -hmm. they have to pick apart what the investments are. So I think they're getting out of my understanding was they're removing out of some of those, but you don't want to take a massive loss on that either. Well, you were 50% invested in China. Oh, I don't, I, I don't think it was quite that high. But by, yeah. by, by, by dollar, you guys were about 50% invested in China. So a few that's, years that's ago, when this was kind of generated that we need to be investing more in the state of North Dakota, the dollars that they, the bean counters figured were going to be uh, generated investing in North Dakota we were going to get about a 1% return 
on our legacy fund dollars that were invested here in the state versus the 10 to 12 percent that we were investing in at that time on these in these other funds so we have to weigh out the, the advantages and the disadvantages of doing such a thing so okay we got one more issue i just have? had a you know a thank you first of all to uh support that you've given to uh, CTE projects in the state. We're building an egg building here in Hankinson for the first time ever. We'll have an egg program starting next year. Um, the funding was delayed, so getting that bill passed early in the session to get the funding out uh, allowed us to, to really get that project going and uh, provided the funding to, to pay those bills. And I hope we have your support. I think in the CTE budget there's some additional funding that might be available. Uh, for these projects because they came in much higher uh, than expected. Um, I think uh, Edgley's project is tied in with ours, and I think their project is at a standstill because of the uh, how the bids came in. And ours came in about 13% higher than, than expected. So we're hoping that, that that will come through that CTE budget and provide some additional funding to help us with those unexpected costs and Chad, allow us to start that program. There's also that piece that we put back in on the whole side. Um, that was using just a kind of a temporary thing, using some of the cold trust dollars. It, it's not a lot of money, but it, it, it would be helping. It was basically for inflationary factors. Yeah. Um, it's in there again. Whether it survives, I, I can't say, but it's, it's back in there. It was amended back into another bill. Okay, yeah. dovetailing right off of that, Chad, they did have another question. North Dakota State College of Science Ag Program has been expanding, yeah. like tripling. So they wanted to expand that ag program, move John Deere Tech over to the diesel hall, and then uh, give ag the room they need, being they have land now where they can actually do hands-on precision farming, everything, and, and that education piece is expanded. <coughs> Nobody thought it would blow up like this, so they need more room right now. And then that also continue the tech side of John Deere to keep our workforce trying to fill our workforce back up. Uh, and it was included as a building in, the, in, a, in a bill um, on the house side. And uh, just, I know Larry updated me a little bit on it, but I, I wanna see where we're at and what's the possibility of this thing becoming a reality because by the time the next session comes around, either this program has to find other areas to, to work in or the program's gonna just kind of fall apart. And that's not what we want. Go ahead, Thank you, Terry. So what I'm hearing on the Senate side is that the uh, there were four projects, four capital projects funded, um, and the SCS was not one of them. The problem with it is that it was didn't have enough um, um, local monies and or it wasn't quite shovel ready enough to do the project. They wanted something that was ready to go right now, and uh, we weren't quite ready with our dollars and plans and everything else that uh, were required. That doesn't mean that it's totally dead, but um, that's the that's the last report I had heard on that. So, okay, Alyssa. Yeah, I, I worked really hard on the, the first half of the session on that with um, the education division of the appropriations, and we were able to move. Um, so the higher ed board had a list of building priorities for campuses and NDSCS. Yes, it's very troubling. They were number 11 on the list for egg. And, and egg is changing so rapidly um, with the technology and uh, you know the autonomous types of um, equipment that NDSCS really we we haven't invested in that that area of our um, our programming and facilities for years. So we were able to get that to number two on the list. And so through some from promises and um, that it came out of the House Appropriations Education Committee higher ed bill. Um, with funding for 20 some million dollars and I had been on the tails of the Senate um, appropriators and a week ago it was taken off the list and I'm really really I'm, I'm, I'm really upset and <clears throat> I've talked to Senator Pro Senate appropriators and I don't know if we're going to get it back on I mean I, I had kind of a run-in with the appropriator from out in Williston area and he just said, you know, I have not forgotten when NDSCS got the diesel program. We were supposed to get it. And, and that was back in like 2013 or 29. And I'm like, really? So there's a lot of power. The reality is there's a lot of power um, in the Senate 
from Western legislators. They're they're leaders of the Senate and the head of the appropriations of Williston. They have a lot of power, and um, so I've I've got to go to work <laughs> this next week or two, and hopefully enlist my friends here and and um, and NDSCS. And I've I've told them we've got to find more um, matching dollars, and we're working on it. But I I, I don't know. Stay okay. tuned. So do you have any comments on that one? No, I'm just looking. That's um, mm -hmm. the House refused to concur to start on yeah. both sides. So it's hey, the, um, the funny thing apart yeah. about this is we have a lot of Western North Dakota students at North Dakota State College of Science. They're coming here to go to school because it's a better program, it's a good program, so that kind of... Well, and but also, please yeah. understand that Dickinson is after a decent program yeah. as well, yeah. so that so is... It's, it's well, this would be the ag program expansion. Yeah, it was only ag, right? I mean, there's, here's what you hear is, well, we don't want to send our Western kids to here, no matter what program, because we lose them. They don't come back. And so there's there's this mentality right now that everybody has to have to look at programs, and I I'm not sure that I really agree with that. Whether it be dental hygiene, whether it be you just name it, it's um, it's probably not the way that okay. we're not that big a state. <laughs> I, I'd like to add. I mean, at some point we've got to make really difficult decisions. There's only so much money, and we have all these higher ed in camp or colleges across the state. We don't have enough students. I mean, we're declining in, in the amount of um, students going into higher ed. And now campuses are fighting one another. They keep adding programs to attract students. And so we're fighting for the same kids and students or adults and for programs, um, enrollment. And an example is, and I, I'm, I'm on fire about this, Dot Botno, which is a great, they've had a great college in, in some areas, but they've now added dental at Minot to compete with our dental hygiene and assisting program, which is a very high cost pro program for NDSCS. And I think it's to save Bono. And now there's talk that Bismarck might be adding dental. I mean, enough is enough. We can't keep doing this because it's going to water down our other programs, reduce funding for our other colleges, and we're not big enough. Okay. Enough of that. Uh, the other thing I will mention at State College of Science, uh, with private funding and challenge grant, we're getting very close to where we'll be able to double our output of registered nurses. We're putting 32 more registered nurses out starting in 2024. So there is some of that going on, partnerships in the background too. So, but the challenge grant is what made it happen. So. Well, you know, interesting enough, there was the nursing dollars. That got rolled into challenge. Challenge got cut in the Senate side. Um, yeah, that's the best dollars we spent. We spent. Yes, it, they work really well. They work well. So but what that what that challenge grant is? Uh, yeah. If I give five hundred thousand dollars, the state will match a, a half of that. So it be, becomes seven hundred fifty thousand. So it's a good program that has worked at State College of Science really well to help move programs on and and uh, build build bigger better. The Senate, that Senate has reduced funding for it, though. So they did again. They okay. did. Yes, well, keep yes, working on it's, it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. It's 1056. Is there another issue we could cover really quickly? Ed? i just like to ask about the legacy fund a few things. How much is in the legacy fund right now, the actual fund? Just under $9 billion. Okay. And what, what's the return on the legacy fund from the investments, etc.? As I was told just recently, it's not that great, maybe 2 to 3 percent, okay. simply because the market is down. That was, I think, in 2022 when that last report came out. Um, Lisa, you know, it's different. I'm, I'm not one of the you know, appropriations. What, being how, how much does it increase from the oil industry tax every year, roughly? You might have that figure to be somewhat accurate. There was a bill that came through that uh, just recently, just a little bit off side note of this, is that uh, uh, it was mandated that 15% of the funds stayed in that fund, that they couldn't take it out and invest it in anything. A uh, bill came through to reduce that down to 5% of the principal to stay there without, uh, because uh, basically there's enough in there that even at 5% that it's going to surf, it's going to be well enough that uh, we're going to need, if we need it for some emergency, for some reason, 
they've got that to cover it. Well, then say say it's roughly nine billion. If you get to five percent, that would be four hundred and fifty million dollars in a year. Then that yeah, the, the, from that that would be the return. So and um, yeah, and, and that most recent like did. March 21st deposit was 60 million from the leg legacy fund earnings that went in for March. Okay. So is that is quarterly or is that a month? Yeah, it just depends on the price of oil. That was a month. <coughs> well, the March it was just March month. Depends mm -hmm. okay. on oil. So if you figure 60 million a month, which is 720 million. Yep. Question, Al. I just want to know why again the oil companies get voted. Um, a tax break again. They had one last time. One of those little steps. Yep. And then you says, oh, we're getting rid of those. We'll just have that one step for we'll five to six. And they're earning this record profits. Let's cut their taxes again. So North Dakota don't get it. Back. Why? Yep, I'm with you. I, I absolutely, I fought against that. I fought against that when it came out to that trigger was supposed to be when they brought it up uh, in 13, I believe it was, uh, to make that set up like that. I, fo I fought for $80, per $80 trigger rather than the 90. Uh, it went to the 90 and then there was a clause in there that it followed inflationary uh, changes. Well, so now it, uh, it's compounded worse than even at $90. So when it comes back, uh, I fought in caucus that no way we should be doing this. And again, it gets back to the western side of the state that uh, just that stopped that and made it, I mean, it uh, took that trigger away. That's $135 million a year, I believe it is, approximately. Yeah, it was extremely disappointing. I mean, everybody knows oil companies were making rec record profits and you know, the, the mineral rights um, holders, their record profits, you know, and it's consumers that were paying those those costs. And I, I thought to take some of that money and really what the oil company, the industry needs is they need investment in, in infrastructure. They're facing some really um, challenges coming up in about 2025 where they're, they're, the ratio as the oil wells age, the ratio of the natural gas, that the flaring that we you know all know about, as oil wells age, it's a three to one ratio. So there's gonna be that much more natural gas that, that comes off these older wells. And so if we really want to do something that's gonna help the oil industry, you should be investing in pipelines because we've got to get that captured so they don't get fined, so they can keep producing. So what's gonna happen is if they, if they don't have a way to get that in the ground and uh, uh, they're avoiding the flaring issue, then they're gonna curtail and slow down oil production. So I, it was very short-sighted. Should have been sp spending that money, that those profits, and, and investing in oil um, or in gas, natural gas pipeline Pipelines. development. Yep.